Now the second handout, you, if you look at it, this is a very short exercise and I encourage you to do this exercise yourself sometime as a form of reflection, is to get to know your own self. Why? Because I think of service learning as an art form. Teaching is an art form. And the most important medium for this artistic, creative form is yourself. And you need to get to know yourself. So go through this exercise. It's simply to mark one through whatever. Um, the statement that most closely fits with your personal philosophy of what reasons for doing service learning. Now, and then share that perhaps with your colleagues and see if you are aligned. Not that they are not complementary, but you're coming from different angles and one of the aspects of this work is the management of different expectations that we have, working, we're not all working out of the same mental map. The second, the next exercise is a little bit more challenging exercise and I encourage you to do this with your, with your group, if you have a group or form a group, um, maybe the University of Louisiana system staff, maybe you could do it in your campus if you have an advisory group or some kind of group, staff, your working group, your support group, do it with them. It's very short, not short, it's kind of a lengthy exercise to do. Let me just describe it and there's something about this I wanna tell you about you. There are A, B, C, D columns. There are statements on the left side. These are all the statements that I've heard from various campuses about why we should be involved in service learning. Everything from improved town gown relationship to transform higher education, promote social justice, um, it is the right thing, to, all kinds of statements there. Pick the four most important constituencies or stakeholders on your campus without whom service learning will fall down dead. That you need their support. So typically they're faculty, students, maybe community partners, your the officials, the leadership of your campus, pick the four constituents and name the A, B, C, each one. So let's say A is faculty, B is your uh, college officials or leadership, and so forth. And then you just pick the top four statements for each column. Your perception of what you think column A, faculty, would mark as their top four statements that expresses their reasons for why we should be involved in service learning and do it with each column. When you're all done, see if there are any lines that go across. That is, is there synchrony or is there mostly diversity? Do they diverge or they converge at some point? And then at the end of that, whole exercise, I want you to add one more column, column E, and then put your name on it. What are your top four? Now, this is super important to look at as self-reflection. Why? If your top four significantly overlaps with the other four columns, your you have a different context than somebody who has no convergence whatsoever. If sometimes you go home and you're so super tired, you wonder what it was you accomplished, you didn't feel like anything in your to-do list was accomplished, at the end of the day with service learning, you feel that you mostly struggled but you don't know why, sometimes there is this invisible, unnamed part of the work that I'm gonna name now which is the management of the politics of this pedagogy. And the politics of the pe this pedagogy is a job all by itself. Every day you're translating the reasons for doing this to the higher ups, to your fellow faculty, to the students, to the community partners, and they don't all agree necessarily. You got some students who are like, well, it's, this is all about social justice. This is all about activism. And if we don't, you know, and you fill in the blanks. And the, 
your other people are saying, well, if this is not about learning outcomes, we shouldn't be doing this. And the community partners are saying, well, if this is not about outcomes in the community, never mind your learning outcomes, we shouldn't be involved with you. So we've got some competing views here. So it's very important that you add yourself to there because you are manage, managing all of this, but you need to be clear about your angle of entry into this so that you keep yourself um, whole and with integrity because the management is not fooling uh, other people. The management is being transparent in who you are and engaging in one of the most important civic obligations that we have, which is managing our differences with integrity, honesty, and authenticity. And this is something we ought to be modeling in service learning. It's one of the hardest things to do. So the last thing for the practical part that I want to share with you in these handouts is the service learning matrix exercise. Now, I've gotten in trouble with this, and I hope you can help me somebody later on if it comes to you what the solution is. But this came from Robert Sigmund, who talked about the small s, small l, big S, big L. And he was talking mostly about, in this very uh, simple quadrant, that on the left side is one dimension, learning. On the other side is another dimension, service. And service learning is about the attempt to integrate as best as possible these two dimensions. Now, on the lowest, lower left-hand side is small s, small l, and Bob Sigmund would say, these are the episodic, uh, brief encounters by design, not by, by outcome, by design, small s service, small l learning, and this could be two hours spent cleaning up the park, three hours spent doing, taking out um, uh, invasive species in the environment. There, there are any number of the most favorite kinds of service experiences that used in freshman year, dorm bonding experiences, the Greek system, et cetera, where people get, get gathered together. But by intention and design, it's not meant to be like forevermore and very, very deep. And it's not necessarily, in quotes, bad. It could be very, very good. Now, but, but it's short term and it's not going to take um, the kind of effort that if you take a look at the top left side, it's a big L. This tends to be embedded in the curriculum, tends to be the courses that are taught. And it's big L because when you think about the number of hours that are spent in service and the effort relative to the big L, this is really privileging the learning part, but we are obliged to pay attention to the content that needs to be delivered, all kinds of learning um, outcomes and so forth. Down at the bottom right is the big S, big L, and there are some campuses that are involved in sustained partnerships, for example, with school districts, where the primary focus is not teaching college students through their volunteer experience. The primary um, obligation or primary arrangement it's a sustained relationship, partnership between the institution and delivering of services to a partner school district, for example. So it's big S. And the holy grail, which is the top right hand corner, is big S, big L, and that we would hope that we can all be there one day. So the way I would suggest using this matrix is to locate your endeavor, whether it's a course, a project, a spring break, whatever it is, and map it on this matrix, realizing that, aware that it doesn't mean that the, just because it's in the lower left-hand quadrant, it's, it's bad, but that's the sources that you have, the design that you have to work with, 
and that the way you strengthen the quality or deepen the quality of it, no matter where it's located in the matrix, is the strength of the quality of the community partners. So for example, you may be doing that episodic clean up the park every year, but it's with the same community partner, same arrangements, and by the second, the third, and fourth year, you've got it down with handouts, a little bit pre and post reflection. Um, there are all kinds of things to strengthen it. And then another way to look at this matrix as a tool is to map out your entire campus. Inventory everything that's happening in your campus that you could identify as service learning. Map it out and color code it maybe with little round stickies on this matrix and then think in terms of a strategic plan. How will you help deepen the programs, endeavors, the things that are happening mapped out on this matrix such that you can tell over a period of time that each of these endeavors that are mapped on the matrix has deepened because you can see that in the quality of the community partnerships. And there's a guideline for community partnerships is the last handout. It's a very simple guideline, it's hard to do. And that is, um, if rigor is a concern in the academy, I ask, what does rigor look like from the perspective of community partnerships? So one is to develop personal relationships, the other is to develop sustainable relationships, Three is integrate the community voice or perspective into the design of the course or the project, and then be accountable to each other. There's not enough time to go through all this, but I'll just leave you with one thing that we learned from being involved in a research project that um, took us to eight institutions, 14 focus groups with 99 experienced community partners. And we asked them simple questions like, what, could, what do you like already? What could be better? And so forth. And there's, there were some things that they said that stood out for me that one, one of those things I should share, two of those things I should share you, with you. One of them was, well, if I could see the syllabus, we never get to see the syllabus. We'd like to know what the students are reading. I mean, maybe we could be helpful. And I'd like to learn myself. So wouldn't it be nice to have the textbook too? I mean, they wanted to know the syllabus. They're really keen to be truly a participant. And the second thing we heard a lot was, well, nobody in my workplace requires me to do this. It takes a lot more work to do this, actually. So why do you do it? Well, I feel we have an obligation to teach the students about the issues we're familiar with and what works and what doesn't because they're going to be participating in voting on policies, in maybe contributing, but basically we're trying to be co-educators, partners with you in teaching. And so that's, those are two things that I hope you carry with you in your work in taking a look at partnerships as a way to deepen your work. Thank you very much.